Welcome to the National Rural Health Executive Webinar Series. My name is Colleen Bay with NRHA Services Corps. I have just a few housekeeping notes to review. Everyone's going to be muted throughout the webinar. We're going to try to get through in about 40 to 45 to 50 minutes, offering time at the very end to review some questions. If you do have a question for any of the presenters, just go ahead and type it into your control panel. I'll make sure that it gets covered at the very end. And as a reminder, this event is being recorded and you will receive an email by the end of the day with a link to the recording. Today, we have three presenters, Louise Bragg, Carla Wilbur, and Lindsay Korakran. Lindsley has been with uh, Stroudwater since 2013 and has more than 35 years of experience in healthcare management and clinical operations. She has a proven record of accomplishments in developing and executing initiatives to enhance access and improve quality and cost effectiveness of healthcare delivery in both public and private sectors. At Stroudwater, she focuses on population health, strategic planning and operational improvement, and models of care, including patient-centered medical home initiatives and team-based care initiatives. Carla is an accomplished nurse administrator with a background in critical care, education, and emergency services. She has been with Stroudwater since 2014. Prior to Stroudwater, Carla spent time at Wake Forest Baptist Health Lexington Medical Center, where she was Director of Enterprise Excellence. In this capacity, she led, facilitated, and supported the Lean Transformation Initiative across the continuum of care and health systems and was responsible for the development, implementation, and ongoing assessment of comprehensive performance improvement and lean redesign initiatives within the healthcare facility. She is also a seasoned clinician and worked directly with patients in the facility's outpatient surgical department as both unit coordinator and as endoscopy registered nurse. Lindsay is an accomplished consultant and practice management professor with over 10 years of healthcare and medical office experience. At Stroudwater, she focuses on supporting and sustaining healthcare access for rural communities through hospital operational improvement and affiliation strategies and has assisted rural and community hospitals and clinics across the country to improve operational and financial performance. Results oriented and highly organized, Lindsay is a skilled communicator with medical providers, patients and administration. Before joining Stroudwater, Lindsay worked in an outpatient physical therapy setting as practice administrator for three clinics in Southern Maine. I would also like to take this opportunity to say thank you to Stroudwater. Stroudwater comes to us through our partnership with Stroudwater GCL, which is a company focused on providing rural hospitals and health systems the ability to invest in needed infrastructure to improve the health of communities they serve. Stroudwater Associates is a healthcare advisory firm focused on improving strategic operational and financial capability for rural and community hospitals, healthcare systems, and large physician groups. Stroudwater Associates and Greater Commercial Lending partnered to create Stroudwater GCL, and together they play a significant role in supporting NRHA. At this time, I'm now going to turn it over to Lindsay for our feature presentation, Improving Opioid Management in Primary Care. Lindsay? Great. Thanks, Colleen. Um, in front of you, um, and welcome everyone, um, thank you for listening into our webinar this afternoon. Um, you'll see we have uh, an agenda packed. Um, we're going to be just um, briefly going over just kind of setting the stage around the um, U.S. opioid epidemic, and then we're going to jump into um, the real meat of our webinar today around the six building blocks program and provide some insights um, on, on the program. So if you want to go to the next slide, we'll we'll jump right in. So briefly, we wanted to kind of set the stage on the U.S. Um, opioid epidemic. You know, so you know, focus currently has really been on the pandemic that we're all um, experiencing, but you know, the U.S. opioid epidemic continues to to increase. Um, in, since uh, 1999, the uh, number of overdose deaths. Um, attributed to opioids has increased um, sixfold. And, you know, it's been reported that the overall change in the levels of pain um, reported by Americans has not really changed. Um, the number of over overdose deaths has continued to climb year over year. Um, reported that around 93,000 uh, Americans in 2020 um, died of an overdose death uh, and that's a 29% increase from the prior year. So significant increase in, in, in opioid related deaths and fentanyl being um, attributed to around 60% of those overdose deaths. Um, 
overdose deaths involving prescription opioids have quadrupled um, since uh, 1999 and uh, to, to 2019. In 2019, around 28% of the overdose deaths involved prescription opioids. Um, so really the, the, the focus of our, our webinar today in the six building blocks is around prescription opioids. And on average, more than 38 Americans uh, uh, died each day from a prescription overdose, opioid overdose. So who is at risk? And the, the, the folks that are really at risk for those opioid related deaths are those that are on long-term uh, management for chronic pain. And you know, per the CDC, a report came out that 20% of uh, adults in the US indicated that they experience daily pain. So pain is is here. It pain folks are experiencing, you know, chronic that chronic pain. And a study from JAMA um, in 2017 found that um, that the six percent of opioid naive adults um, continue to use opioids 90 days after uh, their minor or major surgical procedure. So we're seeing, you know, a those those patients that are surgical patients having this long-term opioid use um, post-op. Next slide, please. And here uh, just shows a graph. You know, you, you can see the significant increase in synth and these are opioid um, uh, overdose deaths and. Um, by what type of opioid it was. And you can see that significant increase of synthetic opioids, um, you know, starting in, in uh, 2013. Next slide, please. And, and again, um, this is more recent data um, going up to, to 2020, where that number of deaths reaching and exceeding that 90,000 um, in 2020. And then, e breaking it down into the type of opioid um, where you can see the the significant increases related to op opioids um, natural and semi-synthetic opioids and then synthetic opioids which is that kind of that greenish tealish color um, it, it, and that's where that that fentanyl is included in that so um, you know from a uh, year annual, year over year, um, the increase in opioid related um, overdose deaths continues to rise. And then looking at it from a state basis, and this is comparing um, opioid related deaths. And again, this is just the number of deaths uh, from 2015 and comparing it to uh, the states uh, geographically in 2020 where in 2020, you know, the highest um, number of deaths occurred in California, Texas, Florida, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. Um, and, and those have all significantly increased um, from 2015 to 2020. Next slide, please. And per the CDC, three out of four people who have used heroin also um, have misused prescription opioids first. So definitely a correlation um, between that the prescription opioids and uh, the the use of heroin. Next slide. And we look at the U.S. opioid prescribing rates. Um, the opioid prescribing rate in the U.S. has really kind of peaked and leveled off um, around you know 2010, 2012, and and actually has been coming down um, since 2012. And so you think, okay, great, great news. Um, but the amount of opioids in the morphine milligram equivalent, so the dosage and the potency of the opioid is actually increasing still. So um, although the, the number of, of scripts has been coming down, the, uh, the, the dosing and the, um, the potency of that opioid has been increasing. So the overall U.S. opioid prescribing rate in 2019 was about 46.7 prescription, prescriptions per 100 people. There's certainly some variation across the U.S. Um, some states range below that average. You know, Hawaii, for instance, is has a uh, prescribing rate of about 30.3, um, and 
and increasing to you know 85.8, which is the highest um, among the United States, and that's in Alabama, and that's in in 2019. Those that data is from. Um, and studies have showed in the CDC reports that taking prescription opioids um, over a long period of time or in higher doses can really um, increase the risk of, of an opioid use disorder, overdose, or death. Next slide. And then looking you know, geographically um, at the US, these are the US opioid dispensing rates um, from 2019 and where the highest amount uh, or number of um, dispensing rate is in that kind of that southeast um, section of, of the United States and with Alabama being the highest. Next slide, please. And then um, along with opioid um, dispensing rates, um, what about the opioid uh, prescribing patterns? Uh, prescribing is for opioids is actually highest in the primary care setting. Um, and they actually account for nearly half of all the dispensed opioid prescriptions, more than um, uh, any of the other specialties. The, the rates of prescribing in primary care has actually increased higher than other specialties, um, according to the CDC. And also the average number of days per prescription, that also continues to increase. Um, and so with an average being around 18 days, the CDC actually recommends um, prescribing no more than seven days for acute pain and 14 for subacute pain. So we're still averaging in the United States higher than what the CDC recommends. So there certainly is um, opportunity to, to, to improve in, in that area. And, and we've all heard and um, a growing body of evidence demonstrates that you know, long-term opioid therapy is really not effective for chronic pain. There are alternative modalities and ways that we can effectively manage pain long-term, um, but we're still you know, finding that uh, opioid therapy is, is being used as a preferred method. Um, and then obviously um, we have drug addiction that uh, you know comes along um, with some of this long-term opioid use and you know addiction is a chronic but treatable medical condition and you know according to the CDC as many as one in four patients receive long-term opioid therapy in a primary care setting but also struggle with an opioid addiction so we need to you know make sure that we are effectively managing those long-term opioids to, and to help, you know, our our patients that may be um, on the on the path to creating more of a of a drug addiction. Um, the CDC estimates that over two million people have an opioid use disorder. So only twenty percent re receive treatment. Uh, so certainly a a uh, startling statistic there that um, treatment for opioid use disorder is is still um, short. We're still short in that area. Next slide, please. And then with, um, you know, we have to make the connection also with, you know, substance use disorders and mental illness. And, um, you know, 7.7 .7 million adults have that, the co-occurring uh, mental and substance abuse disorders. Um, and so they certainly go hand in hand. And then um, 37, 0.9% of the 20.3 million adults with a substance use disorder, 37.9%, um, so almost 40% also have a mental illness. And then around 18% of the 42.1 million adults with a mental illness, uh, around 18% also have a substance abuse, uh, substance use disorder. So again, the, the connection between substance use disorders and mental illness is very prevalent. Um, and it's, it's, it's certainly a whole body disease. Next slide. Um, and, and speaking of some of the ways in which um, the, the CDC has tried to, to put guidelines in place or developed in, and they developed and published the um, guideline for prescribing opioids for chronic pain. 
And these are really recommendations uh, for prescribing opioid pain medication for patients that are 18 or older, so your adult population in primary care. Um, and it's it's really focusing on the use of opioids for treating uh, chronic pain. Um, so really, you know, the CDC is really, the goal is around improving the way that opioids are prescribed um, and, and really putting some, you know, clinical practice guidelines in place to make sure that patients are, um, you know, having the, the, their chronic pain is, is treated in the most effective um, and safe way. Um, while reducing any type of risk for opioid use disorder, um, overdose, or death. And these are why these, um, these guidelines exist. And you can see here um, the various uh, prescribing guidelines, what is included in the, that CDC guideline. Next slide. And lastly, um, with our... We, we have, and your state likely has, um, a prescription drug monitoring program, so a PDMP, um, which is an electronic database that tracks and provides data around controlled, controlled substance prescriptions. Um, you know, your, your healthcare providers are to, you know, when they're writing scripts for a controlled substance, are, are supposed to be entering and checking into these databases to really um, either identify patients that may be misusing uh, prescription opioids or um, just helping to inform the provider on, on what patients have been prescribed um, historically. Um, and so, you know, every state um, has different reporting requirements and everything is, is kind of managed at the state level. Um, so there's certainly some variation on, on how these systems are used. Um, but 49 states um, and the District of Columbia are all participating. Uh, Missouri was the last state to establish a PDMP, um, which became effective last month. So um, very, very good on that front that it sounds like uh, the majority of the U.S. is all using some type of electronic database to track this information. Next slide. Well, if I can get this to advance, there we go. All right. So, Lindsay, thank you so much. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. We really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with you this afternoon. So, as, as Lindsay said at the onset, uh, we, we like to start all of these presentations when we, just, when we are talking about the Six Building Blocks Program we always begin with an overview of the opioid epidemic because we feel like it's really important to really set the, um, the, the importance of the Six Building Blocks program and similar kinds of initiatives in that context. And as Lindsay already said, um, this program specifically really focuses on um, improving the overall management of patients with chronic pain who are on a long-term opioid therapy. So a very specific subset of your patient population for those of you who are um, clinicians or are in, uh, in, in a, a healthcare delivery setting. Uh, so let me say just a little bit here about the program. I'll speak really uh, broadly for a moment about the Six Building Bucks program, and then we'll go into a bit more detail as, uh, as we move through the presentation. Um, this program was developed by folks out of the University of Washington Department of Family Medicine and Kaiser Permanente of Washington State from their Health Research Institute. It was really a clinical research project. Uh, it was co-led by physicians, uh, one from each of those two, uh, those two organizations, who came together and did initially, they were looking a bit more broadly. They weren't initially focusing specifically on opioid management or on chronic pain patients, they were really looking a bit more globally at a num they were looking at, I think, initially 30 different primary care clinics, primary care practices from across the United States that had been identified as top performers. And so they were delving into what they did and how they did it. Um, and out of that really bubbled up um, a recognition around some of the um, key aspects of the way in which all those practices were managing this patient population. And that led then to the development of the Six Building Blocks program, which as you see is described here as an evidence-based 
quality improvement roadmap to help primary care practices and clinics implement a more consistent, patient-centered, and very much an evidence-based um, care uh, and set of care delivery uh, guidelines for managing this chronic pain patient on long-term opioid therapy. And I'll go into more detail in a moment, but uh, just at a high level, the results um, have been positive. They have um, demonstrated both quantitative improvements in patient care and safety, as well as qualitative improvements, really from the perspective of, of all the parties involved, the patients, uh, the providers, and the staff in those um, primary care practices and clinics. The program uh, was developed in, in about the 2016 time period. And, uh, and they've really continued to build on it, and, uh, and, the, and it has continued to evolve ever since. Uh, but it has now been incorporated, this program has been incorporated into the implementation package for that, the 2016 CDC guideline for prescribing opioids for chronic pain, which is the guideline that um, Lindsay just reviewed with you briefly a moment ago. Um, this program has also been included in the Institute for Healthcare Improvements um, set of uh, resources, and specifically, they've developed a toolkit also focusing on the same um, population, those on um, opioids and, uh, and with chronic pain. Uh, so as I was saying, this study um, came out of a, um, the, the development of the six building blocks program came out of a study called the Learnings from the Effective Ambulatory Practices Study, which is quite a mouthful. And as I mentioned, it was really looking at how these, um, this group of practices uh, were managing the, this population of patients, the chronic pain patients on opioid therapy. And they, they through their um, drill down and they're really um, investigating what those practices were doing, how they were doing what they were doing, out of that came a recognition around a number of core elements that, and um, approaches to managing that population that really emerged across those top performing primary care uh, practices and clinics. And so that then led them, as I said, to developing this um, specific program called the Six Building Blocks Program. Um, and they did conduct then a clinical trial. Again, this was the team now out of the University of Washington and the Kaiser Permanente Research Institute. So they conducted a research project, a clinical trial, at 20 of those 30 uh, clinics and um, to, to really test out what uh, might happen if they implemented this, uh, this set of this um, program, the six building blocks program that they, that they developed. They, in that, in that situation, in that clinical trial, they provided, um, there was external support provided for up to 15 months for the participating clinics. They developed an opioid improvement or quality improvement team. You can see then they had a number of specific steps that they went through to launch the program. And a couple of the interesting characteristics, they, they set up then monthly shared learning calls. They created essentially a learning collaborative among these. Uh, these um, 20 uh, clinics, and then they also had access to a um, telepain program that is uh, still to this day uh, made available through the University of Washington, and providers and, uh, and clinicians can uh, participate, can call in monthly to that telepain program. Uh, it's an opportunity where they do case reviews, and it's really meant to be, again, a learning environment for folks who are across the country working to manage this, this challenging patient population. So that's the background, basically, of and the, the, the way in which the Six Building Blocks program was developed. So some of the published results from that work are shown here. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there have been demonstrated quantitative and qualitative benefits. And two very important specific quantitative uh, results were, and you can see here, that over that 15-month period, there was a steady decline in the total number of patients on chronic opioid therapy. And there was also a reduction in the number of patients on high-dose um, morphine um, milligram equivalent, so on a high dosage. Uh, and they defined it for this purpose, for purposes of this study, they set the threshold at 100 morphine milligram equivalents per day, which I will tell you is considered to be high. Um, when you go through this, the um, extensive 
uh, materials that are part of that CDC opioid prescribing guideline that Lindsay uh, touched on, um, they recommend trying to, uh, for those who are prescribed opioids, to shoot for an, a morphine milligram equivalent dosage of under of 50 or under. So you can see at 100 per day, they set a pretty high threshold. But even with that, they were able to demonstrate over the course of time, as a result of implementing the six building blocks program, they did show a, a steady reduction um, in, in the total number of individuals who were receiving that higher dose um, therapy. And as you may recall from earlier, from one of uh, Lindsay's earlier comments, um, the data clearly shows that the, um, the longer individuals are on a morph, uh, an, an, an opioid, uh, for, for pain management, and the higher the dosage, the greater the risk, as you would expect, of, um, of um, adverse outcomes, of, of complications from the medication itself, of potential risk of accidental overdose and potential um, death. So these were really these were the two metrics that they identified as being really very critical to track and monitor over time to demonstrate the impact of implementing the six building blocks program. So in addition to these quantitative uh, and very concrete results, there also were um, some, some real qualitative benefits that emerged uh, from, from this work of, of uh, this initial clinical trial. Um, one of the clinicians, and I believe this was a medical director, um, had, who, who participated in, in one, at one of those uh, clinics that was um, part of that clinical trial, I really, really appreciated his description. He said, having a defined care pathway, which essentially implementing the six building blocks program really supports a practice or a clinic putting that sort of standardized approach in place. So having that defined care pathway for an emotionally charged and complex area of care, to so walk in with a plan, and he compared that to what it's like to be working in the emergency department and walking in or, or having a cardiac arrest occur. And he went on to say, having a cardiac arrest is not the most stressful thing I do because we have a clear plan, and now I have the same kind of pathway for opioids, having what we are going to do defined. And there was also very positive feedback from uh, other physicians, other providers, and clinicians from across those participating clinics. And you can see here, uh, again, a number of positive comments around reducing turmoil, uh, increasing and strengthening teamwork uh, within the clinic. Um, one individual said, you know, hopefully we're not going back to the way it was. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants to go back. And then my favorite out of these quotes, uh, because it really um, demonstrates the potential benefit to the patient, to the member, and that is um, one of the physicians who was involved said, one of my high dose patients that I inherited, so in other words, somebody else had originally prescribed the medication and then now that patient had come to this physician. He said, we got him, the patient, down to 80. Again, remembering that above 50 is considered high, so they were working this person down, got him down to 80 milligrams um, morphine equivalent dosage. And that patient said, you know, I'm more functional. My pain is not different, it might actually be better. And so that was very affirming for that physician and for that staff that their, their steps that they were taking through the um, six building blocks program was not only creating a more, you know, I guess, a calmer and more organized environment for providers and staff, but it had some significant benefits for that patient. And so what I'd like to do now is just uh, run through the core elements, the six building blocks as they, as they named it. Uh, these really are the core elements that make up this program, and we'll go through these at a high level and then talk just a little bit about a few specific areas of focus uh, for, for organizations, for clinics that are interested in beginning to think about implementing this program. So building block number one, leadership and consensus. Uh, as with any sort of um, major clinical quality improvement initiative or project, or a practice redesign initiative, it, it's, in, it's incumbent up, upon the leadership to, to be supportive of that and to be actively engaged in um, building buy-in by the organization 
for, um, for success, for implementation success. So that is the number one building block, uh, that there is active involvement uh, up really to the highest levels of the organization to the extent possible to, um, to provide um, information about the initiative and then to uh, provide active support for the work to accomplish the, the changes that that initiative will bring about. Building block two is, is a really important uh, component of this overall, of this model, of this program. And it really, it's a very operationally focused um, program overall, but particularly um, it really is demonstrated through building block two, which focus on, focuses on um, the clinical operational aspects of managing this patient population. So it focuses on policies, procedures, workflows, tools, um, examples are, um, is there a patient agreement document in place, which is for those of you who are clinicians, likely have some familiarity. Many organizations have an established patient agreement, which is a formal document that the patient signs, basically saying they understand that there are, um, you know, certain parameters, their policies and procedures around uh, being on long-term or chronic opioid therapy. So um, for organizations that don't utilize a patient agreement or where there may be multiple versions, um, this program recommends that there be a move to consistency and some standardization. And, and uh, so uh, this in ensuring that there's a consistent and utilized patient agreement would be a cornerstone component. Uh, looking at workflows, as I mentioned, uh, and then the companion uh, policies um, that are necessary really to support the workflow changes, um, the patient care management changes that the organization decides that they will make in the context of the six building blocks program. Building block three is all about tracking and monitoring patient care. Uh, similar to um, the patient-centered medical home model and other team-based care models, uh, there are many common elements that um, you also see in the six building blocks program. It's really grounded in some of those core, what have been really identified as best practices for, prim for, for primary care delivery. So tracking and monitoring patient care. Um, that can be, a uh, part of that would be, is there a mechanism to identify all the chronic pain patients in the clinics, uh, in your primary care clinics or across your primary care practices who are on long-term opioid therapy? Do you, do you, does the organization even really know who they are, how many of those patients there are at any point in time? So identifying the patient population and then beginning to be able to take proactive measures to better um, manage them would be areas of focus for the um, third building block. Of the fourth building block is about planned uh, patient-centered visits, and that really focuses on uh, particularly pre-visit planning. So what's the process that a clinic or a practice follows when they are preparing for the, the group of patients that are scheduled for appointments for the next day or looking ahead out over the next few days uh, in, in the day-to-day -day life of that clinic? So is there a mechanism in place to be able to, ahead of time, uh, take a look at that medical record, determine when was the last prescription, o opioid prescription filled, as an example. Uh, when was the last time that prescription um, uh, monitoring database was checked that Lindsay spoke about a few moments ago? Is there a process in place to check that database? Is it being done on a consistent basis? And is that, is that information being documented? Um, is there a process in place to do random urine drug screening, which is another a core element when you look at the CDC opioid prescribing guidelines as another way to be consistently monitoring this patient, uh, this patient population. So are, are there mechanisms in place to, to do that? And, and then is that something that is being looked at as part of that pre-visit planning so that the gaps are identified and then anything that is past due or would be important to do, again, can be uh, built into that upcoming patient visit. Building block five is looking even more specifically at a subset of this population, which is looking at those who have developed opioid use disorder and or who have that co-occurring uh, mental behavioral health uh, condition that Lindsay spoke about a few minutes ago. So they have dedicated one building block to looking at the most complexly 
um, um, the most complex patients in this population and those who would be um, considered to be at, high, at highest risk for overdose and for death. And then finally, building block six is measuring success. And again, as with really any kind of quality improvement um, um, initiative or quality improvement program, uh, it's important that the organization have identified uh, some metrics uh, for monitoring the ongoing uh, performance of that, of that initiative or program, and really as a way to be able to quantify the impact and to demonstrate the impact and the success of the program. Um, the CDC has established a list of 16 uh, quality metrics that they um, recommend for consideration. Uh, what we would strongly recommend is that an organization who's planning to move ahead to implement the six building blocks program would start out with a, a small number of, um, of the, what you would determine to be the most important metrics um, to, to track and monitor. And starting potentially with those two that I showed you um, for, the, for the clinical trial results, um, tracking the number of patients on high dose opioid therapy as an example, tracking the total number of patients on opioid therapy um, over time so that you can look at the impact and, and ideally, again, look at reductions in, in both of those metrics. Uh, when they developed the six building blocks program, the group, the Washington State team, did also not only define these six building blocks that I've just discussed, they also uh, recognized and, and uh, really um, just defined a set of three stages. Uh, the first stage is, uh, as you would expect, is prepare and launch. And I've really touched on a couple of those elements already. Uh, but you can see here there are some key activities that um, they recommend uh, and, that, um, and that we recommend uh, occur during that prepare and launch stage. Uh, forming a team and building leadership support are, are crucial. Um, as, as I've already mentioned, uh, since building block one is all about leadership support, and no surprise that that's a part of stage one. And I'll say just a moment in a moment about, um, I'll say just a bit more in a moment about uh, forming an opioid improvement team. Uh, conducting a baseline assessment is really important as you are uh, if you're thinking about um, moving in this direction and implementing this program, you want to start out by really understanding what is current state. Who's currently doing what? How are they doing it? Who's using what guidelines? Are folks using a guideline? Those are all the kinds of things that are important to assess uh, when you are conducting your baseline assessment. Uh, stage two is then basically you've, you've laid the groundwork, you've done the initial, you've had the conversations, you've made the decision to move ahead. And stage two, you're really beginning to do that work. And I've already touched on, uh, you're really beginning to delve into uh, revising or developing new policies, new procedures, new workflows, et cetera. And then stage three is you've, gone, you've done all of that work, you've gotten the program up and going. Stage three is now uh, the ongoing monitoring um, and sustaining and refining and improving over time. So you're really taking an approach of continuous process improvement in stage three. I mentioned a moment ago that one of the very important initial steps for an organization that is planning to, to go down this path would be to identify and form an, what the Six Building Block Development Group called an opioid improvement team. So it's really a group of individuals who are going to be, I, I kind of describe it as that, that small working group who will have the lead responsibility to work with the, the providers, to work with the staff who will be participating in program implementation. And um, it's, a, it's very much intended to be a roll up the sleeves working group. Um, so that is the group who would take the lead on really helping to identify all of the what are the gaps? What are the needs? What are the priorities uh, from the standpoint of, of um, really understanding current state and who's currently doing what? And out of that, identifying what are the ways that you want to move towards increased consistency, increased standardization, and evidence-based practice, and then uh, beginning to actually tackle that work. Uh, so in a nutshell, that's uh, what the role would be of the opioid improvement team. Um, the recommendation is that there would be, of course, a lead for the project and that there would be then a representative um, um, participation from providers and staff, clinical staff, 
from the practices or clinics who will be involved in the program implementation. Um, and that, as I mentioned, it's meant to really be a reasonably small um, roll up the sleeves working group. Um, the, another activity that is important and, and it really supports that goal of assessing current state is to use a tool that the Six Building Blocks Development Team created um, called the Six Building Blocks Self Assessment. And it really is a readiness assessment. And there is a, a, a long list. This is just, an, this is literally just showing you a, a screenshot of the first page of the self assessment tool. Um, but they've identified, they've developed a whole set of kind of core elements that you want to assess. And then you are rating, looking and utilizing this tool on kind of where do you see the organization today? So what is the commitment of leadership as an example? Is there a shared vision, vision for safer and more cautious opioid prescribing? And then you would, um, if you were, you or your team were utilizing this tool, you would then assign a, a numeric rating. And at the end, you would, you would roll it all up and come up with an overall rating of where you see yourselves or your organization as it relates to um, achieving the, the, that end state of implementation of the six building block program and those associated um, objectives. Um, there, we've already touched on uh, from the discussion about the clinical trial results, um, but there have been demonstrated, um, definitely demonstrated um, benefits. I've already mentioned the, the quantitative and the qualitative benefits. Um, and we've, we've summarized that here. So examples would be fewer patients on high-dose opioid therapy and a reduced number of patients receiving uh, long-term opioid therapy. Uh, as, as Lindsay mentioned, um, the goal would be to, to try to shift folks to the extent possible to alternative modalities and to non-opioid um, medications if necessary to help them to manage their chronic pain. This program is not about um, disregarding a person's legitimate need for pain management. It's really trying to take a more comprehensive and holistic approach and reducing the reliance on opioids to manage that pain. Um, and then um, there are also some very, um, there are some uh, operational and some financial uh, benefits of, of implementing this program and, and finding success with this program. And that really uh, can be a reduction in hospital readmission rates and ED utilization for this, um, this vulnerable and, and pretty demanding at times uh, patient population. Uh, and, and a little bit later on, Carla will show you some data of the uh, Medicare chronic condition data um, showing uh, the impact of what substance use disorder um, can have in terms of driving up utilization and corresponding uh, total cost of care, which is, of course, of real importance for any organization that's in a value-based reimbursement environment. A couple of other things to just quickly mention around other benefits. Um, one is that um, in the 2021, in this year's MIPS Improvement Activities list, there are several that are specific to this patient population. And in fact, one that actually talks specifically about utilizing a prescription drug monitoring program. Uh, and then you see some others listed. So the, these are, uh, so for an organization that implements the six building box program, that can directly then support the achievement of your, of your MIPS um, requirements for, for the year. I will say that the, for 2022, uh, see the CDC, excuse me, CMS has not yet um, uh, come out with um, with a final rule for 2022 for MIPS. Um, the proposed rule is out right now for public comment, and the final rule is expected later this year. So we don't know specifically whether these elements will will be in there again, and will will continue to be a part of um, the improvement activities. But um, I'm, I think it's uh, likely that some, if not all of these, will, will be there. And then the, the last thing I wanted to mention really quickly is around chronic care management, uh, complex um, care management services, which, as you know, are Medicare coverage services, care management services. So for a clinic who is, is providing that care um, but may not be billing for it, um, there is opportunity where there is more, um, perhaps more formalized and structured work with the um, substance use or um, 
uh, the opioid users, the substance use and substance overdose or substance use disorder individuals, um, to be able to uh, generate some additional revenue through um, utilizing these um, Medicare covered services of chronic care management. And with that, I'm going to pass the baton to Carla for her to um, talk with you about some of the uh, six building blocks resources that are available. Thanks, Louise. All right, so six building block uh, program clinical tools and resources. There are many. Um, all of these um, areas um, underlined here are live links that you can go to. Um, they have a model policy. Um, that could help you it, as you move through um, bringing the program to life, a policy checklist to make sure that you have your policies that do align with evidence-based guidelines, a patient agreement, which is really important. But the most important thing I think on this slide is a patient letter. Um, we in our clinics want to make sure that patients <clears throat> know that this is a new approach in our clinic and that this is an an approach for everyone that will alleviate any of the concern that patients have that maybe this is just being changed for them. So um, to make sure that we really highlight this as an overall standardization of um, uh, processes and a change in our overall clinic and not just for that one uh, patient. Next slide, please. Um, and here are some more additional uh, resources. The um, Alternative Treatments Fact Sheet is really uh, a good resource as well. Um, the Pain Tracker that can be used um, to help um, uh, focus the um, uh, pain scale and um, assessments of pain during your visits. Um, a suggested opioid management schedule. Um, and then other assessment tools. I really think that this CDC opioid guideline mobile app is great. Um, that's something that could be downloaded on a smartphone. And as the, um, as the prescriber um, it puts in the different dosages, it can help them um, also calculate um, the, um, the um, MEMs um, as well. Next slide. Uh, this is some more uh, that has to do with education. Now, these educational opportunities, um, the, the first um, live link there for clinical education is great. Um, it has a lot of um, different uh, interactive um, uh, training, um, addressing the opioid epidemic, some dosing um, information, um, uh, the opioid use during pregnancy and motivational interviewing, which is really important for this patient population. Um, there are also some webinar series within the, that clinical education um, that goes into all different um, uh, topics of te uh, in telepain. Um, also some um, empathetic communication resources. That's very important. Um, to make sure that um, all of the clinicians and all the staff um, have gone through that training. You know, the training can also be used um, for your, um, your annual continuing education in your clinic for the, um, for the uh, staff members and making sure that they do accomplish so much within this uh, particular um, um, opioid um, program so that, you know, everybody stays on top of what is the uh, new and greatest uh, evidence-based guidelines um, for managing opioids. And then the pain science, um, there's a really um, good uh, pain etiology course um, that also comes with some um, CMEs as well. Next slide. All right, so um, as we have worked with different um, states and different um, um, uh, people regarding um, the Six Building Blocks program, um, we've done a couple of different things. One of the things that we did um, for a couple of states recently was to hold webinars. Um, and we did a webinar series around the entire Six Building Blocks program. So we did uh, an introduction to Six Building Blocks um, and then we went through the building blocks and did a deeper dive of all six um, building blocks. 
and then um, a webinar around how to get started with the six building blocks program. Um, we've done that for um, a couple of states for clinical, uh, for practice uh, managers, for the staff member, and quality um, leaders within those clinics and hospitals. Next slide. We've also done um, implementation support for a group of clinics um, where we went through the entire um, six building blocks program, helped them to evaluate what they have in place, um, kind of get current state and what's not um, in place at that time, um, helping the um, with through interviews, kind of a discovery process um, to help understand what's um, what the um, practice is the processes are within the practice, um, surveying the um, practice teams to, uh, for understanding their um, chronic pain and opioid therapy practices um, at the um, current time, um, and then identifying those really those gaps, doing a gap analysis and providing some recommendations for the, the clinic and the leadership as they move forward. Next slide. Um, also, there's a great deal of education that goes into um, that with all of the staff and providers and leadership, making sure that everybody has the tools that they need. Again, back to that education and resources, these tools change frequently, what's best practice, we need to stay on top of that. Um, and then facilitating an action plan session so that they can go ahead and build their program um, for their clinics and standardize everything. Next slide. This is our six building blocks team at Stroudwater. Of course, you've um, met virtually Louise and Lindsay and I. Um, we also have another consultant that works with us, Claire Kelly, and then an analyst that help, helps us with our data, Keith Bublow. Um, this is the uh, Stroudwater um, offerings. We're advisory service as we, um, as we were introduced earlier. Um, and we, our practice is um, very, very um, much within the rural space as, um, as it has been described. These are some um, things within our appendix that we've, um, that we've um, had here for you. And this is what Louise was um, mentioning earlier. This shows the prevalence. Um, this has to do with the Medicare chronic conditions and the prevalence that within um, a group of chronic conditions. And you see drug abuse, substance abuse um, is not as high, of course, as hypertension and hyperlipidemia and so forth. Um, it kind of, but it's interesting as we move through the slides, you'll see a very different, um, a very different picture. The ED visits, um, drug abuse and substance abuse is top on the list of um, ED visits under the Medicare chronic conditions. Next slide. And very close to the top of, for hospital readmission. So obviously, um, this is something that it definitely needs to be um, uh, dealt with and addressed um, within, our, um, within our primary care clinics. Next slide. And then per capita spending, um, we're kind of um, uh, about three fourths of the way at the top. So there's a lot of money that is spent in um, drug abuse and substance abuse cases um, within our Medicare chronic condition spending. Next slide. And now um, we will open it up for uh, questions and Q&A. Thanks so much. I do have a couple of questions here. Um, I'll let you you guys decide who wants to answer them. First one is, what is the expected time commitment for individuals who want to participate on an opioid improvement team? But, thanks, Colleen. This is Louise, and I'll I'll field that question. And, and that that's a great question. Uh, and there clearly is a time commitment. As I mentioned earlier, when I talked about that, um, the formation of that team as being one of the important uh, kind of initial steps as an organization is getting ready to, to launch the implementation of the Six Building Blocks program. Um, the, the estimates are, or realistically, I guess, expectations can be uh, for the project lead, for that person who's going to be the overall project lead, 
um, they can realistically expect, I would, and I honestly think that this is probably on the low side, de depending on the size and the scale of the, of the organization and the number of practices or clinics that are going to uh, implement the program. Uh, so that I should probably caveat what I say. It's, it will be very dependent on the, the size and the, and the scope of the, uh, of the, of the plan to implement. Um, but having said that, the project lead should certainly assume at least uh, uh, up to eight hours a month. And I frankly think it's probably more than that. Um, the, um, there's also a suggestion or a recommendation that there be at least one, perhaps more, uh, clinic, clinical champions that are identified. <clears throat> and the six building block uh, group, when they created this model, uh, when they think in terms of a clinical champion, they're really thinking about a, a provider. Um, how that is very important since this is so much about the way in which the physicians, the providers, the mid-levels or the physicians are managing this patient population and specifically managing opioid prescribing, it's really important to have a physician champion to, to um, support the endeavors around operational changes that we've talked about and also will be uh, not just an advocate but then really help to set that expectation going forward that providers will utilize the agreed upon, um, follow the agreed upon policies, uh, adhere to state requirements related to tapping into that state um, prescription drug monitoring database, whatever it might be that has emerged as gaps or inconsistencies across the practices, you want that physician champion to be at the table and helping to move this forward. Um, tracking and monitoring is another important point. And so the, one of the recommendations is that somebody who's on a part of it, who's a part of that opioid improvement team would have responsibility for helping with that, uh, that data collection, that data monitoring. Um, that's typically going to be somebody associated with the quality um, department or quality um, team. And that's probably, your, again, you'd probably be looking at maybe in the neighborhood of four to six hours a month. And then lastly would be other members of the committee. Um, the, the recommendation is that the committee would meet formally once a month. In, in our COVID world, that could certainly be a virtual meeting or a face-to-face -face meeting, but that there be a monthly coming together of that group and that um, then there be probably subgroups who are working simultaneously on different pieces of that improvement plan that have been identified. So one group may be working on developing some workflows, another may be revising the patient agreement. Um, whatever, again, has been identified as the needs, then you wanna divide up your opioid improvement team and have them actively be leading efforts to, to develop or, or to revise those, those components. So you'd be looking at uh, realistically, probably two to four hours a month for for that uh, for that group of folks. Thanks so much for that. Uh, just time for one more here. What are your suggestions for increasing provider buy-in to implement this program? Um, I'll take that one. This is Carla. Um, there are a lot of different resources within the six building blocks um, resource site. Um, however, I think the most important thing is to make sure that providers understand that this is not something that um, we're asking you to do to cause you more work. Um, actually, it's the opposite. It's to standardize the processes to mitigate some of the uncomfortable problems that come up within, um, within the clinic with the, this patient population. So it's really to help standardize and streamline the processes that will then um, cause them a lot less less work. So I think um, having um, you know really really communicating with the providers how this can be of a benefit and not something that we're asking them to do even more work. Thanks so much. All right, so I don't have any other questions at this point. I'm just going to go ahead and thank everyone for their time today. Thank you for this presentation and thanks to all of our attendees for joining us. As a reminder, you're going to get a link to the recording within the hour. You could also view any of our partner webinars online at nrhapartners.com under the Rural Healthcare Learning Center. 
before I close out this webinar, is there anything else that you'd like to impart on us, Carla, Lindsay, or Luis? Um, Colleen, thanks. This is Luis. The only thing I would also add is that we will be sending out of uh, the uh, PowerPoint presentation to those who registered for today's program and to, and of course, to, to all of you who attended today. So again, our thanks for your participation. We hope this has been helpful and certainly don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have other questions or would um, like some additional assistance to, to, uh, to find, out, find out more about this program. So again, many thanks for your participation today and we will send out the presentation to you um, in, uh, within the next several days. Great. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe and healthy. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.